The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of GodQuest Ministries. It was good when God was done making the world. That's what we're talking about today on the Creation Today show, where we believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate in every single detail. I'm one of your hosts, Eric Hovind. And I'm Paul Taylor. And this is the fourth of our special programs based on Eric Hovind's beginning series. In fact, although it's the fourth program, we're now on the third part yeah, of the beginning series. I love this session. That's right, entitled It Is Good. Yep. And we'll be looking at uh, why God kept saying it is good throughout Genesis 1 and eventually saying it is very good. You've got to stay tuned to watch this. You're watching the Creation Today show with me, Paul Taylor, and with Eric Hoven. And we've been filming a number of special episodes based on Eric Hoven's beginning series. And we're actually on the third part of the beginning series, though this is the fourth of the special programs that we've done from the beginning series. Uh, the first episode uh, we did, um, uh, just, just outlined quickly. Yeah, again we were talking us. about the fact that both creation and evolution are religious worldviews. That is a foundation point that we have to start with as we we learn, you know, really what is the beginning of this argument? Creation and evolution are worldviews, depending on your definition again of evolution. We looked at that. Then we saw that the world really isn't old. It's actually only about six, well, 6,000 years old. That's right. Um, according to the Bible. And then in the third session, according to science, it, it backs up, it confirms what the Bible already teaches us. The world is only a few thousand years old, not millions or billions. So we've been looking at some very, very important and basic stuff from the beginning series, yeah. which is a, a superb resource that will get you started on this whole subject of creationism and Genesis and uh, how that is opposed to evolution. And remember, you can get hold of the beginning series in its entirety, not just the excerpts that we're using. You can get hold of that from creationstore.org. That's creationstore.org. I love that store. Yes. It's, it, I've, I've, it comes highly recommended. It's very yeah. highly recommended. I yes. give it five stars. Yes. You get a smile <laughs> when every time you uh, come into the store. That's right. So we're going to be looking at uh, taking stuff from the third of your uh, sessions, which of course is the fourth, confusingly, of our programs that we've done from the beginning series. Yeah. And this one we've entitled, It Is Good. Yeah. Now that's a quote, isn't it? It is, <laughs> it's a quote from God himself, because after the days of creation, he would conclude the day by saying, and it was good. Now, what did he mean by that? Why, why did God keep on saying it is good? You know, as he is showing his uh, approval of what he's done. He's giving himself approval for what he has accomplished. I mean, he is God, so you know, uh, it doesn't go. You don't go up from there. He is he is validating what he's done here. Where after each day, he's saying, "Hey, it was good. What he had done was very good." And then he gets to the end of creation, and that's kind of where this session concludes. At the end of creation, he says. Behold, it is very good. Not just good, but very good. So really emphatically says, man, the way God made it originally, it was perfect. It was good. And man, when you look at the science, which is what we're going to see in this session that backs this up, some of the things we've discovered about what the world would have been like before the flood, oh man, totally different world. That's right. And, uh, and of course, as you said, the phrase, it is very good, is talking about God having completed everything. Yeah. It's perfect. So how much of his creation was very good at the end of? He says all of it. He looked, yeah. it says, behold, he looked at everything that he had made. That would include everything that he had made. And he yes. said, behold, it is very good. And before we get into some of the details of the, uh, the evidences that you bring out in, uh, in the series, um, you know, what's, what's the other point of view? The other point of view is that there's been millions of years of uh, evolution with death and disease and destruction. And there are some people who believe, don't they, that uh, Adam and Eve were um, some sort of evolved ape men. So yeah. God's put them in the garden after millions of years of death, disease and destruction and presumably a fossil record and thorns That's right. and things like that. And then he says, it's very good. 
Does that make sense? It or? doesn't make sense at all. I mean, you've got the atheistic evolutionist that says there is no God, none of this is true. Then you got the theistic evolutionist which says God controlled evolution. The problem is that position doesn't fit with with God's Word. It doesn't fit with the Bible. God's Word says He made it in six literal days. He doesn't just say that in Genesis. We talk about that on the, on the Creation Today show regularly. Yes. It's not just in Genesis that He says that. It's elsewhere in the Bible. Your series that you're working on, The Six Days of Genesis, goes through and talks about all the different places yes. that day, uh, day is used and what exactly it means. So, yes. um, no, it could not have been after millions of years, despite, despite what some probably well-meaning Christians are yes. teaching, they're compromising on what God's Word is saying. They're compromising on, on God's yeah. Word, that's right. And uh, we're going to be looking at an excerpt from uh, the session uh, entitled, It Is Good. And uh, obviously, to begin with, you're talking about what uh, the world would have been like. And just paint yeah. a picture for us of a world that is good in the way that God has described. Well, some of the things you guys are gonna see uh, in, in, this, in this section, for example, when you look in the fossil record, they find fossilized dragonflies with a 50 inch wingspan. Wow. You're like, well, that's not good. <laughs> well, <laughs> You'd need a large fly swap. You would. Yeah. Uh, need a big de bug deflector going down yes. the road, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, fossilized cockroaches have been discovered 18 inches long. Fossilized centipedes, 18 inches, yeah. Fossilized centipedes, eight feet long have been discovered. So huge things have been discovered. Not only that, uh, fish, um, uh, rhinoceros, lots of stuff has been discovered that shows before the flood, this world was a totally different place. It was incredible. Truly, when God was done, it was good. So we can't look at what the world's like today and use that to describe what the world no. was like at creation. We're gonna see some of those evidences coming up after this break. Dragons, are they merely mythical or do they have a basis in reality? The answer, based on evidence documented from around the world, will astonish you. Dire Dragons provides revolutionary and profound evidence from ancient artwork that there is a real, powerful, documentable, and defensible connection between the dragons of ancient times and the dinosaurs we know so well from fossils. To order this beautiful hardcover book, go to creationstore.org. The world would have been very, very different before the flood with this layer of water surrounding it. Now, by the way, not only was there a layer of water surrounding the atmosphere, I also believe there was a layer of water underneath the crust of the earth. The Bible talks about this. It says he stretched out the earth above the waters. Interesting. Another place in Psalms, it says, The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. He hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. I believe the pre-flood world had a built-in sprinkler system underground. It was really cool. The Bible talks about that in the Garden of Eden, how a mist went up from the ground and watered the whole face of the earth. I believe the pre-flood world had a built-in sprinkler system. There was water underneath the crust of the earth. By the way, there still is water underneath the crust of the earth in many places, okay? So the original creation was very different than what we currently see today. The original creation was good, and it was very, very good. You say, well, Eric, what happened to all that water? The water that was above and the water that was below, where, where is it now? Well, it's still here. It's just not all in the same places. You say, well, how did it come down? The Bible tells us about that in Genesis chapter 7. Check out what it says. That same day, all the fountains of the great deep broke up, and the windows of heaven were opened. This is talking about when the flood came to destroy the world. I believe when the flood came, the water that was above came pouring down, and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And the water that was above the atmosphere came pouring down as rain. And the water that was underneath the crust of the earth came shooting up out of the ground as the earth cracked because of the weight of all this water. Hey, maybe that's why we still have fault lines in the world today. You know, there are fault lines that go all over the globe today. I've been to many of them, the Nematic Fault, the Hayward's Fault, the San Andreas Fault. None of them are my fault, but I've been there, seen them, have a t-shirt. These fault lines run all around the world. I can't help but think, what if those are when the fountains of the great deep broke up, just like the Bible told us happened, at the time of the flood. Interesting. You know, there's a new theory out about what killed the dinosaurs. Some people are saying maybe lack of oxygen is what actually killed the dinosaurs. 
You say, how could lack of oxygen kill a dinosaur? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, here's what they say. They say an 80-foot-long Apatosaurus had the same size nostrils as a modern-day horse. Not as the horse, but as the horse's nostrils. They, never mind. Anyway, this 80-foot-long animal is trying to suck wind through nostrils the same size as a horse's, horse's nostrils today. How, how is he going to breathe? He would have a very, very hard time breathing or snore really bad, one or the other, okay? This guy couldn't breathe in today's environment. But what if there was that canopy of water? And what if it did give us more atmospheric pressure so that every time you breathe, it's easier to breathe and you get more oxygen into your system? Interesting. Then he might have been able to live no problem. You know, they find amber, which is petrified tree sap. Sometimes they find air bubbles trapped inside this amber. When they examine the air bubbles, they realize these air bubbles contain 50% more oxygen than what is in today's atmosphere. Interesting. Today's atmosphere is 20.9%. This stuff has 35% oxygen. Wow. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but under those conditions, if you had, say, double atmospheric pressure and increased levels of oxygen, get this, under those conditions, not only would your hemoglobin take on oxygen, but your plasma would get oxygen saturated. You guys have no clue what that means, do you? <laughs> that means you could literally run for hundreds of miles and you'd never get tired. Adam and Eve didn't need a car. They could run to grandma's. <laughs> Except they didn't have a grandma. <laughs> or a mother-in-law. <laughs> I think that's why they called it paradise. But uh, anyway, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. My... My wife has a fantastic mother-in-law. She is really, she is great, I tell you. She really is good. But um, yeah, under these conditions, life would be very different than the way it is today in today's world. The original world was good, man. Let me tell you, it was really, really good. Now the sun is sending down x-rays down here, and all day long, you and I get x-rayed from the sun. These little x-ray bullets are coming right through the buildings that you're in, right through your body, right into the ground. And every single day of your life, you're getting x-rayed by the sun. You guys know what an x-ray is, right? It's one of those things. If you ever go to the hospital to get an x-ray, they put you in this little room. They tell you to take off all your clothes and put a gown on. The gown that they give you never comes together in the back. It's a little bit embarrassing, okay? Then um, they, you, you come out, you know, holding your clothes and trying to hold the gown together. They say, okay, we need you to walk down this hallway about 12 miles. When you get down there, you should see the x-ray room. All right. So you finally make it down the hallway going like this. You get down there, you get to the x-ray room, and the guy says, oh, I'm glad you made it. Come on in. And he makes you lay down on a freezing cold table, okay? Freezing cold table. I mean, you start to stick to the thing if you're not careful, all right? Then he puts a funny-looking machine over you, tells you to take a deep breath, and then he runs away. You say, wait a minute, Doc, what's going on? What you doing? He says, well, we're going to have to x-ray you. You say, yeah, I got that part figured out, but why are you running away? He says, well, this machine is dangerous. You say, well, then what am I doing here? <laughs> he says, oh, no, don't worry. It's not dangerous if you're only going to get a few, but overexposure to x-rays is very dangerous. So that's why he runs and hides behind his lead wall, because lead or concrete or a certain amount of water will stop harmful x-rays. Interesting. So they put that machine over you. They take an x-ray. These little x-ray bullets go through your body into the table, into the film that's underneath the table, and they actually expose what's inside of you in reverse image, which is why, by the way, many radiologists have a negative outlook on life. I don't know if you've met any of those, but I certainly have. Now, your skin has to battle the war against these x-rays, okay? And after several years of battling the wars against the holes that the x-rays are putting in your skin, eventually your skin's going to start to give up. It's going to start to lose the battle against the x-rays. And eventually your skin's going to start to get wrinkled up. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. You say, Eric, I don't want to get old and wrinkled. Okay. Die early. <laughs> There you go. Problem solved, right? All right. 
So the, uh, the interesting thing, though, is the sun is sending down these x-rays to us all the time. What would happen if there was a layer of water that surrounded the Earth's atmosphere that filtered out the harmful x-rays from the sun? I wonder what life would be like then. You know, it's interesting. The Bible tells us how long people lived. The average age before the flood really was, according to the Bible dates, 912. Some people say, Eric, (laughs) you don't understand. A year wasn't really a year back then. A month was a year back then. Yeah. To get their real age, you got to divide by 12. I don't think so. Uh, Did you know that Enoch was 65 when he had Methuselah? A couple of people were 65 when they had children. Let's see, 65 divided by 12. That means they were five and a half when they became a dad. Uh, No, they didn't count every month as a year. They really did live to be over 900 years old. Not only did they live longer, they also grew a whole lot bigger back then. Here's a statue of Robert Wadlow, tallest man of last century. Robert Wadlow stood 8 foot 11 and a quarter inches tall. Here he is next to his dad and his brother. Big boy. Absolutely enormous boy. Lived in Illinois, all right? Robert was a big boy, but he's not the biggest one that's ever lived. They found a skeleton in a coal mine in Italy of a guy 11 feet 6 inches tall. How'd you like to have him on your basketball team? Yeah. That would be nice. Hey, throw the ball to Herman. (laughs) Drop it in, Herman. Good job. Go down there and do something now. Okay. Now come back down here. Wow. That would be absolutely a lot of fun. They have found unbelievable skeletons. I'm telling you guys, from, I believe, before the flood. A skeleton nine feet, eight inches tall was found in a burial mound in Indiana. A skeleton 10 feet long was found in Nevada. They found eight giants together, uh, skeletons of them, ranging from eight to nine feet long. They say, though, they say, through the bungling of the diggers and the total disinterest of the archaeological museum establishment, these discoveries have been scattered and lost. Excuse me? How do you lose a nine-foot skeleton? (laughs) Where did I put him? He's gone. (laughs) That does, and why would you be disinterested in it? Wouldn't that generate some interest? Unless you believe in evolution. See, according to evolution, we evolved from primates. And we're supposed to be getting bigger and better, stronger and smarter. And this kind of goes against the evolution worldview, the religion of evolution. So you might have to cover up some of that stuff. They found a skeleton 12 feet tall in California. Wow. Another one was found in Arizona, 12 foot tall skeleton. Here's a human skull that was discovered that is almost twice the size of yours and mine. It's huge. Unbelievable. How about your thumb? You guys got three bones in your thumb. Make sure you guys got all three of them. You got all three? There should be a middle one right there, okay? They found a middle human thumb bone to a guy that was three and a half inches long. I think it's safe to assume that guy had a big thumb. (laughs) Probably had a really big hand and was probably really big himself. He was a giant. You're not going to believe me, but in Egypt, they discovered a 47-inch long femur. That's the bone that goes from your hip to your knees. I've got two of them personally, okay? 47-inch long femur. That is is impressive. The guy that owned that thing had to be really big. They guess anywhere from 15 to 16 feet tall. So if you ever meet one of his brothers, call him sir. (laughs) Or whatever he wants to be called, okay? But don't mess with him. Absolutely don't mess with him. They found a jawbone of a guy that was six and a half inches from TMJ to TMJ. We could like fit that over our jaws. Huge. You know, the Bible tells us there were giants in the earth in those days. You know what I believe? There were 
giants in the earth in those days. That's exactly right. Now, not only were people living longer and growing bigger, animals lived longer and grew bigger before the flood. And there's lots of evidence to support this as well. They found a fossilized hornless rhinoceros that was 18 feet tall. That's a big rhino. Hey, with the, with the conditions the way they were before the flood, with the canopy of water surrounding the atmosphere, giving us more atmospheric pressure, insects could get a whole lot bigger. Because insects can only get so big based on the atmospheric pressure. Because they breathe through their skin. Well, I wonder how big insects could get before the flood. Check out this fossil. It is a fossil dragonfly. You say, who cares we got those today? This one happens to have a 50-inch wingspan. How'd you like to hit that at 70 miles an hour? <laughs> Take the bug deflector and the hood right off, man. Wow, that's going to be a problem. You guys got cockroaches around here, right? They have found fossilized cockroaches 18 inches long. Ladies, what do you do when you find one of those in the kitchen? That's going to be bad, okay? They've discovered fossilized centipedes eight feet long. Huge centipedes have been discovered. Fossil grasshoppers two feet long have been discovered. Fossilized cattails 60 feet tall have been discovered. A fossil donkey was discovered in Texas that was nine feet tall at the shoulder. Whoa. Buffalo horns have been found where the span of the horns from tip to tip was 12 feet. Big buffalo. Fossilized beavers have been discovered eight feet long. Huge beavers have been discovered. Here's a beaver's jaw. They say this beaver had to be seven to eight feet long. Our three most popular resources are now available at a special package price. Get our award-winning creation seminar, our beginning series, and our topical Godonomics series, all for just $99. For answers about creation, evolution, and dinosaurs, thousands around the world have turned to Dr. Kent Hovind's fast-paced, fully illustrated creation seminar. It's our most requested resource and now features 31 foreign language subtitles. For a creation experience for groups, Eric Hoven's Beginnings series includes a handy guide that provides practical ways to apply each lesson to everyday life. Hear what the Almighty says about the Almighty Dollar in our new topical DVD, Godonomics, a fun, engaging, fact-filled journey into God's wisdom on money. For a limited time, get all three resources for just $99. To order, call 1-877-479-3466 or visit creationstore.org for the Big Three Package. Welcome back. You're watching the Creation Today show with me, Paul Taylor, and with Eric Hovind. And you've just seen an excerpt from uh, Eric's beginning series, which is a very important introduction to the whole uh, story about creation, the whole history about creation uh, versus evolution, and uh, why you can be you can trust Genesis is true. So it's a very very important series to get, and the series yeah. is there so that people can study this in small groups and in churches, isn't it, Eric? That's exactly right, and I love this session that we're talking about. It was good because so many people have this confused. There's a, there's a lot of confusion between, okay, when God was done, was everything really good? It, was there death before sin? Later places in the Bible say, no, there was no death until sin entered, entered into the world. So we've got to see from the very foundation, from the beginning of God's word, when God originally made this world, it was good. Today, we live in a cursed world. Uh, matter of fact, Darwin himself said, I had no intention to write atheistically, but there seems to be so much misery in the world. And he was exactly right. Today we see lots of misery. This isn't the way God made it. Originally God made it good. That's not the way it is today. That's right. But it, I mean, taking Darwin's idea, he believed it had always been like that. That's correct. So from that point of view, if that's what you believe, then there's no reason to believe that it won't always be like that in the future. It's always going to be bad yes. in, on that worldview. Christianity, a biblical creation is what gives us hope because the Bible says, hey, this is bad. I mean, the whole creation groans and travails in pain. 
waiting for God to come redeem it. Yes. So that's right. We get something good to look forward to, God's yes. redemption. And conversely, those Christians who don't believe the things that you were talking about in this episode, that, uh, that it was good at the beginning, what hope have they got to look forward to? What grounds they presumably are looking forward to a hope? But That's a good question because if there was death before sin, before the fall, before all the bad stuff started to happen, is that what it's going to be like in the future? Because our, our desire, our longing, when something bad happens, if something bad happens to you or somebody you love, inside you have a desire, a burning desire going, this isn't right. All is not well with the world. You see it. You understand it. The reason you feel that is because you know that God exists. You know that all is not well with the world. You know there needs to be something done about it. And God is the only one, the Christian worldview is the only one who says, you're exactly right, and God will do something about it. Now, you argue very powerfully in this, uh, in the excerpt that we've seen, that the pre-flood world was very different from the post-flood world. It, yeah. it, it's very good when God made the world, then the sin came into the world, but things don't deteriorate too rapidly until you get to the flood, and there's a great change there. So you were talking about some of the evidences we mentioned just before the excerpt about giant cockroaches, yeah. <laughs> the fossil record, giant dragonflies, some and so stuff. on. Some big stuff. Yeah, and d what do you attribute that to? Why, why do you think there were things were so different before the flood? Well, um, I, I go back to the way God originally made it. This world was designed to be inhabited. It was designed to be incredible. Now we're cursed today, okay? So I've got genetic load, I've got deformed chromosomes. If I go back and say, what would the world, what would God, if God could make it perfect, what would that look like? Man, we get to see from the Bible how long people live. We, I believe we were designed originally to live forever, to fellowship with God forever, which is still God's plan, but he's just having to redeem us is what's going on. So uh, originally we were designed, I believe, to live to forever. Uh, average age before the flood was 912. Then you see um, animals from before the flood. The science that we see shows this world was a different place. This was a different planet. Truly it was designed to be inhabited. Today, what is it, less than 30% of the world, or uh, yeah, less than 30% of the world is land, and less than, I think, 2% of that is inhabitable, where you can yes. live. So the pre-flood world, we got 7 billion people alive now. The pre-flood world probably could have had billions and billions of more without any problem. Yes, and uh, so therefore conditions very, very different before the flood yeah. to what they are. Uh, to what they are now, yeah. and you look in uh, you looked in the excerpt that we looked at at some of the reasons for that. Remember, folks, that you can get hold of the beginning series uh, to use with your small group discussion groups as a, a leader's guide with the pack, so that the leaders of the groups know exactly what sort of questions to be asking. And you can get that from creationstore.org. Well, this has been a production of God Quest Ministries. Thank you so much for watching. Bye bye. This program is available on DVD by visiting creationstore.org or by calling 877-479-3466. To order this episode, use the item number displayed on your screen. 